This is Marcia Stonehill with Melt the Ice. Today on Operation Flow, I have the privilege of having back with us Carolyn Curtis, an advanced practice registered nurse who just spoke to us very recently. Uh, we have a part one. This is part two of a series on her work in midwifery. I invite you to please go back and listen to part one and to definitely listen to the beginning where you get to hear her bio and her extensive experience throughout the last several decades as she brings a wealth of knowledge and experience to us. So Carolyn, I wanna thank you so much for coming back to us today to share more with our listeners about uh, experiences you've studied, that you've personally experienced and that you want us to be aware of. Thanks, Marsha. I'm happy to be back. So tell us what we're going to pick up with today. We uh... So um, I reviewed the last video that we did and we were talking kind of about seeing others looking at uh, racism uh, in a way that we start to see others as less than who we are and how that affects um, the ability to provide care or to treat others in the same way that we want to be treated. And this is very, um, it's clear throughout uh, when we look at what has occurred um, with Blacks and other people of color uh, in this country. You're reminding me, um, it was, do you mind to share with our listeners what you experienced after you did our first podcast? Um, I had quite an emotional experience um, because even now, <laughs> you go through a lot of experiences, you do what you need to do to um, exist in that particular occurrence or experience, and you move on. You don't sit and take the time and dissect it and say, well, how did I feel about this? How did I feel about that? And over time, um, those things instead of really kind of experiencing what you did feel at that particular day and time, um, you just keep moving. And when you have the opportunity for that to be recalled, there are emotions around it. Um, you're like, why did I have to go through that? You know, why did I have to deal with that? Um, why do I have to continually prove myself? Why do I have to, um, you know, it's, it's, let's just say in the black community, and I'm not sure if, if whites have heard this, but in the black community, we grow up with the sense and being told that you have to do things twice as good for it to be good enough. And so at some point, your question is, when is good enough good enough? Uh, when you, when is it good enough? I mean, there are times where you're, you can see yourself compared to another white colleague and know that, why do I have to deal with this? <laughs> you know, why is this not good enough? Or, or when you have seen it with another colleague, you know that uh, the judgment is a little, the playing field is not even. That's how I would say. Right. And at some point you kind of get a little tired of that where, I mean, I've got the same education. I've passed the same exams. I've done the same things. Um, I can say that um, at times you may feel that no matter what, I could have more education, I could be wealthier. 
I could have achieved more. However, because I am a black person, it's not seen as good enough compared to a white person. Same thing. So um, I'll say that because that's how a lot of people feel. It's a truth. And the question is, when is it good enough? And I want to say there, too, that this is where implicit bias can come in very strongly. You know, people may consciously think, well, I'm not like that. I see all people as equal. I love all people. But what I'm hearing you say, in a way, it was making me think of that there's a different lens in which you feel like you're being judged com comparatively. And so that we as white people need to make sure we truly are using the same lens mm -hmm. when we're looking at any and every person. Mm -hmm. And um, those are just the thoughts that entered my mind as you were sharing. So I, I was just listening quickly this morning. It was a, just a very short reel that was on um, YouTube. And... Um, most recently, there has been the Supreme Court decision against affirmative action uh, for admission to colleges. I think what people need to understand is that affirmative action is not a thing where I just get any old person off the street and put them in the position just because they're Black. You have to be qualified. You have to be qualified. Otherwise, you would never, ever succeed in environments, this per this woman was talking about um, when she went to Harvard, she was qualified. Harvard came looking for her. And to keep in mind, you know, I'm doing you a favor, basically. I'm helping you to fulfill your requirements uh, for the federal government, for you to get the money that you are needing to get at your institution because I'm coming as a black person who has attained the necessary requirements for admission. I just happen to be black and I just happen to not have the money due to the structural racism in this country that has made it impossible for me to you know, be able, I have to strive so much harder to get the same amount of money that whites have. If you were to look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics, you can go and see the earning power for black men, black women, white men, white women, Asian men, Asian women. Mm -hmm. All that information is there. And so um, if it's left up to that family to be able to afford to send you to Harvard, it would never happen uh, for, for many families. I'm not going to say for all black families, because there's a whole nother social strata in terms of those who have income and wealth it just isn't in a white community so it's you know you have some in the black community who are quite wealthy and others who are not i didn't come from a family that was wealthy we worked hard um but i got scholarships for school i got grants for school but i didn't get them just because i was black i got them because i had the grades to be able to succeed in that university setting yes so I want people to kind of understand that. It's not just scoop up any black person and just add them in because you're black. It's you're there because you met the qualifications to be there. And that really is probably one of the biggest biases that you will hear mm -hmm. when it comes to affirmative action and those sort of things. So I'm so thankful that you're speaking into this and making, giving our audience an opportunity to hear a truthful perspective. And, and some of that is around <clears throat> sex and gender of the applicant as well. So I've helped that university fulfill in one person, fulfill having a woman and having a black. So I help you knock out two criteria. So <laughs> I'm helping you. There you go. <laughs> That's the way our systems are set up, right? Yeah, I'm helping yeah. you, please. So uh, we were talking before we started recording about some very critical information you have uh, where we want to kind of turn back to empowering people to 
uh, feel empowered to ask questions, be aware of what's happening with them, trusting that they know their body better than anybody else. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to receiving medical intervention, particularly your mission is on midwifery. So women who are expecting or in other situations, um, but you have a, a, a difficult, painful history of information um, to share with us. Can we can we go ahead and speak? Sure. Um, I was looking, um, I'm interested in looking at race and how that affects medicine, uh, the field of medicine. Um, we know that there has been a lot of medical experimentation uh, with Blacks and other minorities in this country, including Latinas and Native Americans. Um, I can go through quickly and, and the reason why this is important to me is to help childbearing families understand the importance of knowing this history and the importance of also knowing that they have a voice when it comes to their medical care. You have a voice, you should be informed about yourself. You should also be informed about what are the procedures um, and understand that when you sign a consent form, that you have the absolute right to make alterations, write what you need to write, to make sure that it is uh, actually providing the consent that you want to provide. So if we were to go back and kind of take a look, um, at, we can go back to slavery. And this is kind of a roundabout way to answer your question, Marsha, but uh, to kind of go back and to get a sense as to what happened with medical care for slaves as they came over um, on the uh, Middle Passage, as we call that, um, keep in mind that slaves were considered property. Uh, you could claim insurance claims uh, if there was any uh, problem. And so if slaves became ill, they were thrown overboard. Why is this? Because they were able, the slaveholder was able to collect insurance money for those that had died en route. And so part of that, if you got sick, they just toss you abroad. You're nothing anyway. Um, so this went on. Um, once you were on the plantations, the ability for you as a slaved, enslaved person to be able to take medication on your own was not there. That entire responsibility um, or right was given to the slaveholder, and they were the ones who made the decision as to when and if you received medication, um, what you got, um, and sometimes you may have been forced to take medication that you did not want to have. Um, medication was not always used in a curative sense. Medication was sometimes used to embarrass the person taking the medication. Um, an example of that is medication being given to force someone with vomiting and this was seen as funny uh, before the slaveholder's family. And so medication was given as a means of recreation and entertainment. Um, it was sometimes also done forcibly where you did not want to take it, but you were at gunpoint or whipped to take this medication. So even at the point in slavery, you had no control over your body. You had no control over when you took medication. It was forced upon you. Um, I know you're on a roll there, but I remember when you shared one of the articles with me, there were just other heinous and torturous methods used with medications as well, uh, such as using laxatives and then putting yes. people in confined spaces where they would expel their waste on each other because there was no other choice because of how they were forced to be together exactly. uh, and it, it, reading this material for the first time in my, in my life right in 2023 not learning about it in public school system exactly. just the degree of heinous activity that went on I had no idea as a nurse um, that uh, slaveholders that that slaves 
weren't taken to doctors, that it was their slave owners, I guess you would say, that were were doing medical practice. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we really need to look at this, you know, as you're saying, to look at the history look at where we've come from where to see where we're going yes um i have a litany of things that really take us from slavery through to the night you know to present day um there's it's known that schools of medicine in this country um in order to further their own research and medical education they would dig up the bodies of black uh, persons who had died, which only offers a total lack of respect, no consent from family members to do this, just a sense of that I have the right to do what I need to do to advance medical education and knowledge. And so in 1824, um, the Medical College of South Carolina talked about the number of corpses that they had dug up to be able to further um, their medical research. And this was done without any consent. This didn't happen only at the Medical College of South Carolina. Johns Hopkins University has been blamed for doing this. Um, You can see that in um, information that you can Google. And I'm sure there are other schools of medicine around the country in which this practice occurred. So again, it just shows lack of respect, really don't care about you as a person and the reverence of the grave site, but we need another body to be able to further medical education. Um, Back to slavery again. Um, Keep in mind, as I mentioned in my video last, the last video that we did, Um, that slaves were seen as property and workforce for plantations. And between the stopping of the official stopping of the slave trade where slaves were brought to this country, slavery did not end in the United States until some decades later. And so women, slave women were seen as the breeders for um, the slave holder uh, to be able to increase the workforce. Well, this happens even now. When you have a lot of babies, it weakens um, the uterine wall. Um, And also in the process of having your baby, it's possible uh, with pushing that you are able to tear the tissue that is um, there with the urethra, which is the tube that brings urine out of the body and also the rectum. We know the rectum is for feces. And so um, once this happens, women are not able to work. And so rather than be concerned about the fact that these women are unable to work, there was the decision that we needed to get this fixed. And so women underwent um, forced uh, procedures without their consent um, and without anesthesia can you imagine in your female part of your body having this sort of thing occur, surgery occur um, without your consent, knowledge, and also without anesthesia? And this is at the time when anesthesia was available, but it was not provided to these women. Um, Marcia uh, is aware of uh, more information uh, that's come up about this. Um, I don't know if you want to speak to that, Marcia, but... Sure. Um, You are speaking specifically of Anarcha. Yes. And the three women that are, uh, we're being taught about are are Anarcha, Lucy, and Betsy. And there's a team of professionals that have been working very diligently, including uh, an American historian, an artist, uh, the artist in Alabama, her name is Michelle Browder. She has uh, structured some beautiful statues in honor of these women. Dr. J.C. Hallman has written a book and has a YouTube series that uh, speaks uh, very specifically about these heinous crimes and uh, the exposure of it. And there's even question as to whether 
uh, the gravesite of Anarcha may be here in King George, Virginia. That's wow. uh, being researched. Mm -hmm. So now we move to the 1900s. <laughs> And in the 1920s, in the last article, I mean, video, we talked about how um, in the 1920s and 30s, how uh, birth began to be medicalized. And sterilization also started to expand more so, um, affecting both men and women. First, it was more for men, but then it was affecting now women. And can you believe in 1927, the Supreme Court decided that... Um, this was okay. And so this assisted in the expansion of forced sterilizations. Um, between um, like uh, 1920s up until let's say the 1970s, we're looking at, at probably more than 60,000 women who were forcibly sterilized. Uh, first, it was a thing of being feeble-minded. And then the definition of feeble-minded gets to be a very broad definition there began to also be more um, uh, attention to women of color, mainly black women, Latina women, and uh, Native American women. And even under the Medicaid program that we know now, between 1960 and 1970, it's thought that 100,000 black, Latina, and Native American women were sterilized under that program. Now, if you currently have Medicaid, I remember when I was practicing as a midwife, you have to sign papers, and this is where this comes from. You have to sign consent for sterilization 30 days in advance and be told that you can change your mind at any time. And you would need to bring that paper with you to whatever facility you're going to when you had your baby or whenever you're planning to have the sterilization for me, most times women uh, wanted to have that after they had had their baby, they were already in a hospital facility, already had uh, anesthesia available to them. So often they wanted to have their, what we call having your tubes tied um, once they had had their baby. So if you were to look at the Medicaid consent form now, you will know that it has to be signed 30 days in advance. And it is because of the atrocities that happen with the forced sterilization of Black, Latina, and Native American women between the 1960s and 1970s. Um, so <laughs> the thing of it too is um, as a part of this forced sterilization, um, Fannie Lou Hamer, who was a very, uh, as a famous civil rights activist, went into a hospital in South Carolina. And um, besides the procedure that she needed, they did a hysterectomy on her without her knowledge or consent. And um, that's why it is so important that when you are signing consent forms, that you understand exactly what you are signing for, that it has been explained to you that you do not sign anything until you have read the document and you clearly understand what you are signing for. Um, the thing that's very difficult to know is that forced sterilizations are still legal in the United States in a number of states, that it is possible um, that the court could um, force a sterilization on someone still. So it's something to know. So that was the 1920s to the 1970s. Now we come up with the Tuskegee syphilis experimentation, now with, with the medical experimentation on men. This um, study, uh, this was done by the US government, the Public Health Service. This started in 1932, where 400 sharecropper, black sharecroppers were initiated, they were signed up for this study. And um, the purpose of the study was to be able to see what would be the natural occurrence of the syphilis disease if it was left untreated. And penicillin, when the study was initially started, penicillin was not available, but, but penicillin became available. And once penicillin was available, do you think that they informed these men? Do you think that they um, 
made sure that they got this no. They were more interested in seeing what would be the result if you just let it go and just left it untreated. This went on from 1932 until 1972 when this was discovered and reported by journalists. And of course, now everybody in Congress is like, oh my God, how could something like this happen? Well, it happened. Your public health service, which is US government, planned for and allowed this to occur. So we wonder um, why, and this, you know, why Black people have concerns about research studies, have concerns about even COVID vaccine. Uh, it's kind of because of this history that people are like, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? Uh, and even you will see even with currently, even with research that there is an underrepresentation of black people in research studies. And some of this, particularly this Tuskegee uh, syphilis study uh, is one. The last thing I wanna talk about um, is Henrietta Lack and Johns Hopkins in this 1951. We're talking almost 200 years, really, of medical experimentation that has happened in the black population and with other people of color. Henrietta Lack uh, had cervical cancer and she was treated at Johns Hopkins. And we know anytime you go in, people wanted to say, oh, let's do a biopsy. What they're trying to do is get a piece of the tissue um, in that area to be able to grow it in the lab and see what's happening with it. Is it cancerous, whatever, whatever, okay? So during her treatments, um, they obtained the tissue and what they found as they grew her tissue is that her tissue did not die. Usually human tissue outside of the human body will only reproduce for so long and then it will die. Hers didn't die. Hers is known as kind of a, an immortal, um, like her cells were immortal. And so Johns Hopkins basically just gave her cells. First of all, they didn't tell her that they were collecting these cells. I mean, you don't need 50,000 cells to do a tissue biopsy to see if you have cancer. You just need one or two specimens, but they continued to get specimens and then allowed these cells to reproduce uh, in their labs. Currently, as of today, um, her cells are known as HeLa line of cells. Her cells, we're talking 70 years later, are pretty much in every lab around the world but without the consent of her family. Um, she has revolutionized medicine. Her cells have been used for vaccines such as the polio vaccine, the human papillovirus uh, vaccine, the HPV that is being um, uh, endorsed or really promoted to help prevent cervical cancer. Um, her cells were also used in the production of the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, in 2013, we're talking 62 years after her cells were initially harvested or taken from her, 62 years later, there was a lab um, in Germany that pretty much just produced her entire genome. And the genome is your entire DNA, RNA, everything, uh, if you understand the genome. And without consulting her family, and the family's concern is now you've got all this genetic information for everybody in the family out there. And so they had to reach an agreement about this. Um, as a result of that, one of the family members sits on the board of NIH to make decisions as to who is able to have consent to use the HeLa cells. Mm -hmm. um, and this, I mean, very recently um, in 2021, the family sued a biotechnical technology company in Massachusetts because what they had done was to um, use the, her cells 70 years later without any permission. And as they say, you know, here all of these companies are making billions of dollars 
off of the cells of their family member and they were never consulted, provided consent, particularly initially. Um, there was a movie made uh, by Oprah Winfrey uh, in 2017 that talks about uh, Henrietta Locke. And so I would uh, advise you to take a look at that movie. It's a really good movie. Um, but, you know, th this is why <laughs> we need to be very careful with consent forms, why we need to really understand and know what we're signing, what we're given consent for. Um, and, and also as a result of all this thing that went on with Henrietta Lack, we hear now about HIPAA. So the whole privacy is coming from that. Um, also, um, the consent forms used around the world globally to be able to provide informed consent and to protect your privacy. So, you know, it's just nonstop, huh? <laughs> We're talking over 200 years of where there has been medical experimentation on Blacks, um, lack of dignity expressed towards them where you can just take their cells, you can treat them however you wish, you can give, withhold medication. The other thing too um, is this idea that Blacks have a lower pain tolerance than whites. Mm -hmm. I don't know where that came from, but it's not true. And so even now I would assume that um, there might be the thought that, well, she doesn't need pain medication or he doesn't need pain medication for this because Blacks have a higher tolerance for pain. Not true. So be clear, not true. <laughs> okay. Or they're just drug seeking, right? That That's the other life. thing. Yeah. Um, I wanted to say, I want going back to the sterilization, you know, that was, it really kind of peaked in the 1950s. And as I was reviewing this information this week, I was very struck and very saddened by a thought that I had. My mom, um, there are four of us in our family. Um, the last three children are cesarean section. And we were born in the 50s at Johns Hopkins, okay? My sister is 11 months, three weeks uh, difference. She was a surprise baby. And... Um, my mother in her late 80s said to me, I had my tubes tied. I was told that, you know, if I had another baby, that it would threaten my life. And as I looked at this information and thought of the location, Johns Hopkins, as I thought of the time we were, this is the 1950s. I was born in 54, my sister 1955, when this whole forced sterilization was really on a wave. I thought, oh my goodness, my mom had her tubes tied more than likely without asking her, without getting her consent, and she was informed after the fact. And that makes me so angry. My mother was a very intelligent woman. You mean to tell me that, and I don't imagine that my mother would carry this with her. She was Catholic. And if, I mean, if we know the whole thing of family planning in the Catholic church, can you imagine what that was for my mom? And can you imagine that, that my mother carried this? We, you know, when we were born, my mom was in her thirties and she carried this with her for over 50 years in her mind. I mean, if you gave consent, you wouldn't be bringing this up 50 years later. And so I'm thinking, oh my gosh, my mother was sterilized without her knowledge or her consent. Mm -hmm. And I would bet for those that may be listening, this might be the case in your own families. And this is why we're talking about these things, right? You know, you've provided us with an incredible, painful historical review, but it touches our lives today. You know, I know defenses come up 
when we talk about these sort of things, like, why are we talking about this? That's in the past. We need to just move forward. These things aren't happening anymore. But what is still happening is that people don't, uh, they may still see the medical professionals as authoritarian. Oh, yeah. Or they, or some medical professionals may behave in an authoritarian manner instead of treating you like you are, uh, like you know your body and just giving you the information that you need so that you can make the decisions for your own body that you need to make. Right. 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 And I know that that is we have to keep talking about these things so that we understand the relevance of using our voice, asking questions, not being shut down by uh, resistance to our questions, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I spoke to you about that there was a book uh, written by a, a, a physician titled Managing Your Doctor, where he's encouraging the exact same thing you're speaking of, of that we have to take control of our health care. We have to advocate for ourselves. We have to ask questions. We have to do the research. We need to understand and come back to our physicians or midwives, nurse practitioners, PAs, nurses, all, you know, our healthcare professionals with the questions. And if they're agitated by our questions, maybe we need to seek uh, health care elsewhere, if we can, or get a health care advocate that will assist you and in, in your advocacy. I agree. Um, and I've done a lot of advocacy for my own family members. And I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, I'm getting this kind of reaction. And I'm a health care provider. Right. So imagine for those who are not. The one thing that I would like for everyone who may be listening to this is to kind of flip the switch in your mind. You know, I think I'm a healthcare provider. I've been a healthcare provider since the 1970s. There's the white coat. There's the, all of this. So when you walk in the door, it's already some power dynamics just visually. But I want you to think about this, no matter how you pay for your health care, whether it is private insurance, whether you pay out of pocket, whether it is Medicaid, you did pay taxes, okay? You are the person hiring this other practitioner to help you with your health care. Yes. And I think if we can begin to think in that way, that it may embolden or help you to be able to ask the question. I know when I worked um, as a midwife and we often would help our patients with family planning, during their pregnancy, we would begin that conversation. And I think women were so relieved because around seven months you'd say, okay, well, you know, this is your second baby or, you know, what are your plans? When do you wanna have your next baby? And I think the women were so relieved that we asked that question because I don't think they knew how to ask the question. Sometimes asking about that may give a sense that I don't want to be a mom. You know, it's not it at all. It's just parenting. I mean, it's hard. Okay. And, and it takes a lot and it takes a lot and it's a lot on your body as well. So it's, it's healthy to be able to say, I, I want to space my babies. And we also know from research that if you space your pregnancies, you have better outcomes for the children as well as for the family. So um, uh, I just want to encourage um, those who might be listening to think, to kind of change that thought. You're hiring them. They did not pay you to come and see them. As a matter of fact, they will charge you if you miss the appointment. Right. So you're paying them. Um, the other thing to know is that maternity units are being shut down across many parts of the country because people are not using them. Mm. They're depending upon your dollar to be able to survive. And so you have the right to make sure that you're getting your answers, that you're getting the type of care 
that you deserve. And if not, you have the right to go and move to someone else. Yes. Um, and don't feel bad about it. You're paying for that care. They they will think nothing of charging you whatever the amount of money is per visit, per hospitalization, per anything. Isn't that no eye is not blinked. You will get that bill quickly. So think about it. You're paying them. So I, I would love to uh, have people think about that and consider that. Yes. Well, Carolyn, I know uh, when we first started, before we started recording, we said we were going to try to keep this at a 30 minute limit and we've gone over. No. <laughs> so it's been, the information is too important and uh, clearly you're going to have to come back for a part three. <laughs> but uh, I know you have um, some business uh, ventures um starting tomorrow, correct? And then I just, so I want you to tell our listeners about what you have rolling and direct them how to find you. And then uh, kind of wrapping up what you want people to really take away today. Um, yes, I do. Uh, I'm very concerned about the number of women who are dying uh, due to pregnancy related causes. Um, women are dying in the first year after they've had their baby. And um, my concern is that they're not getting the care that they need. Um, there's probably unnecessary things happening or they're not being directed to where they need to go in time. And so I've started a YouTube channel to uh, talk about uh, these things, um, to kind of look at all the ins and outs around pregnancy, what you should know, <laughs> these sorts of things that really help provide more information um, so that you can be more uh, actively engaged with care. Um, I will provide you with the YouTube channel and Facebook page. You can just look up Carolyn Curtis, um, MSN. <laughs> I think if other, there are other Carolyn Curtises as well, but I can provide that, which I'm sure you can provide um, with a video. Um, it will be uh, 30 consecutive days of live information so I want you to come on, um, participate. Let's go on this journey together to learn more, uh, hear concerns that you have. Um, that's, we'll be starting. Um, so, yeah. Carolyn, thank you so much for being on Operation Flow again today and for bringing this wealth of information to us. We appreciate you. Thanks, Marsha. Thank you.